All right, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to our first Google Meet of the year. Okay, um, I'm gonna go ahead and put you on the big screen so the rest of the class can see you guys up there. So it'll take me just a moment. And if I screw this all up, forgive me. Because this is super tricky. I've got two computers going and all kinds of different things to keep track of. Craziness. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, so that goes away. Bennett, did you sign in? Nice. All right. Now Bennett can see himself on the big screen too. Right there. There's one, I have one on me right now. Okay, so for those of you guys that are at home, I just moved the Google Meet onto the big screen. And so you're gonna see me turning a lot um, because I'm looking at the big screen. I'm not gonna be looking directly at you guys. Also, your, your peers might wave at you. They're gonna be waving at the big screen. You guys, the camera's over here. So if you wave that way, they're actually seeing you're waving. Marin is back too. Hi, Marin. Nice to see you. And um, yes, let me write Evelyn a pack. Microphone. I'll be right back. So like I had a fish that was in there for 10 years um, who passed away at the beginning of the pandemic. Will I what? It's not going to croak for a long time. Um, yes. And why do you want to know if it croaks or when it croaks? They're asking about my, they're asking about when the, the fish in my tank die. It has a it has an automatic feeder on the back, so it feeds twice a day, and then I come in every two weeks um, to clean the tank and to just check on them and make sure everything's working and whatever. And so it's not a big deal. <laughs> um, I've had a fish tank for about ten years now, I think. My oldest fish passed away, so a little bit more than ten years. My oldest fish passed away right at the beginning of the pandemic. He was super cool. It was a plecostomus that was like this big, so a bottom feeder. He's humongous. Um, I'm not really clear. So he had had seizures earlier in the year. It was, I know, you know, you absolutely know. We're talking about a fish. Nope, I don't know. What are we talking about? Jessica was the fish I had. 
No. Like they weren't seizures because I just am a bad person. Okay. I don't know what she's talking about. I didn't remember. Was this from a long time ago? I forgot. Yeah, Did we talk about this? Okay. I do remember that. So my my big placostomus had seizures in the tank, and it was very disturbing because the seizures went on off and on for about a week, and my students could see it, and it was suffering, and it was horrible, and it was just like he was shaking. and But then he stopped. Then he stopped, and he lived for at least another six months after that. And so we never saw any more seizures after that. But yeah. So it's a yeah. That is something that I I have anyway. never been able to do is to I can't kill an animal like I, maybe a spider maybe but I I just can't kill like a mammal. We're on a tangent here. Can you tell? What? All right. I haven't heard. That. So I did ask my other class, because we're in the middle of this pandemic again. Oh, yeah, you did show me that. I remember you showed me that. So Lindsay had a fish that also was doing seizures, and she's showing us the fish. Um, since we're in a surge on the pandemic, I asked my other class for you to turn to your neighbor and tell them what was a... What was something that you lost because of the pandemic? For example, you were supposed to be in a play and it got canceled, or you were gonna be in an athletic activity and it got canceled, or you lost a family member due to COVID or whatever. What's something that you lost because of COVID? What do you not have because of COVID? If you guys wanna put something in the chat space, I'd love that, that'd be great. <laughs> ah, I lost sense of smell and taste. <laughs> I think you're not alone in that. I lost any semblance of time to myself. Mental health. Yeah, lots of people lost their mental health. That's not, that's not, not surprising. Not, I don't mean surprising, but not uncommon. I'm opening the chat space so that you guys can chat about anything I can see it. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, share out with me. Tell me a loss from the pandemic. What's something that you lost because of the pandemic that you didn't get to do or whatever? Evelyn? I'm skipped to to Mexico like two spring breaks ago, but then I ended up going like the next spring break. Okay, good. Yeah, we were going to go to Mexico also and didn't get to go to Mexico. We still haven't gotten to go to Mexico, unfortunately. Parker? Yeah, mental health is a, so the loss of healthy mental health is a, a symptom that many, 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 many people are experiencing. Lila? Um, I lost the ability to see my friends who were sheltered in place and I hated it. Totally. Totally. We lost the ability to be, and I think that we lost some of our social skills. Like, we're not as good at socializing as we may have been. Okay. Thank goodness. I only saw her in the dance. Yeah. Were you guys in your a bubble together? Were you in a bubble together? Okay, who was raising their hand over here? I saw a hand. Liam? You lost your house? Yeah. So you moved or what? I don't know what you mean. Oh my gosh, Liam, I had no idea. What? Kyle just said his house burned down too. Did you guys know that Liam's house burned down? I didn't know really anything about this. Liam is laughing right now, so I'm assuming yeah, it, it, was, it was last month. So, so our, our new house is almost done. And we're gonna oh my gosh. Yeah. You and Liam? Now or you were? And you will be. Same property? And where are you living right now? No, we're living in a rental house. In a rental house. Oh my gosh. 
And the same, okay, so people online, I don't know if you guys can hear, can you hear what they're saying that we were talking about um, bad things about the pandemic and Liam said his house burned down and then Kyle said his did too. When did that happen? Uh, no, it wasn't like fourth grade. Uh, okay. <laughs> You guys, that is so sad. Kyle's house burned down when he was in fourth grade. That's tough. Liam, was everybody out of your house okay? Any pets? That is so wickedly scary. Yeah, and, and as I came around from the backyard into the front yard, my sister ran back inside to look for me, even though I was already out of the house. Oh, Audrey. Oh my gosh, Audrey. Oh my gosh, that just. Gives me chills. <laughs> and I bet you lost some birthday parties too, right? You <laughs> just start, I'm afraid, now that we've been depressed by all the bad things that have happened during the pandemic. I'm okay if we just say stupid pandemic and move on. Okay, stupid pandemic. I'm ready for this to be done. Stupid pandemic. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Um, I can turn sideways to see where I'm going here. It was a control burn. <laughs> While you're starting to quiet down, let me just mention really quickly that this is because of the pandemic. I have 8 million emails from students who are out and having questions and how can I make up this and that. And um, so if you emailed me a question and I haven't responded to you within 48 hours, just email me again and assume that it got lost in my sea of 8 million emails. I'm really sorry. If you really have an important question, those of you that are in person, talk to me in person. Um, and that'll help me get through my emails if not everybody's emailing me, but it's just, it is what it is. So we gotta do what we gotta do. All right, so um, I will have a Google Meet open every day during class time for the foreseeable future. So hopefully this will just be a, a few weeks until we're done with this search, hoping. Um, so I'm gonna go ahead and click on our announcement for today. It's not a very exciting announcement. I had to write it during four o'clock opportunity hour. So it says our Google Meet will happen every day until this current surge is over. Today we're gonna finish our labs in class. At home students, I'll post this Google Meet um, so you guys that are with us right now, you're just going to finish your lab with us. You're going to do it with us. Um, but anybody who's not in the Google Meet that's at home, they can watch the recording of the and get their lab done. And then we'll try drawing and cell respiration and photosynthesis. Uh, with the review, we're done with new content for this unit. We'll start unit four tomorrow. What's happening? Oh, it's easier to see. Wait. I don't like the, yeah. Oh, that's sad. All right, here we go. Ladies and gentlemen, would you please open up your Chromebooks and go to your Pivot Lab from yesterday. Put phones and earbuds away. Put your mask over your mouth, even if you're chewing. Who is she talking to? Um, for those of you at home, you may not have had a chance to start your lab yet, and that's okay. Um, I'll, I'll go over everything, but what I want you to do is either you may have had a bookmark from earlier in this year for Pivot Interactives. Those are the online labs. Otherwise, if you don't have a bookmark, you type in Pivot Interactives, P-I-V-O-T, and then log in using your Google account. And then you should see the lab that we're doing. So do that right now. Open up a tab, go to Pivot Interactives, log in using your Google account, and then the lab that we're using, the lab that we're doing today is called KJ's um, Exploring, thank you, <laughs> Exploring Respiration Rates. You gotta keep listening to me and fill me in when I get distracted. It's too much, there's just too much going on. All right, um, so I am gonna go to our lab here. Let's see, is this the right place? No, wrong place, and this one. That's what we want. 
Nope, wrong one. Why would you well, the wrong one. Give me a minute. <laughs> library. No library. Give me a second. We'll open it up so you guys can look at it together with me. This is the one, and we want to preview it. All right, so what we did yesterday um, was parts one and two of the lab. And I made a video late last night. Well, not that late, but I was done at like 930 last night. I made a video so that people who were absent could watch what we did with this lab and could fill in the answers and everything. Um, and then today we're going to do the very last part, which is called part three. If anybody was absent, then I'll post this Google Meet. I know somebody was absent. People were absent. Um, I'll post this Google Meet and then they'll be able to watch this video to finish the lab. Hey, I think it goes without saying, you guys, but on the chance that anything happens like distance learning or whatever, or you or, or you quarantine or something like that, whatever, we're moving forward no matter what. Like, we're not stopping. We can't stop. So the next day we're pivoting online or whatever, like we just... We're not stopping. So just you know, pay attention to that. Be aware that you're not going to get a vacation from me or anything like that. Um, so just sorry, I don't mean to say it that way, but that's the way it has to be or we won't get through this content. And you guys have worked so hard that I'm not willing to throw out your work and everything after all this is time. OK, so let me just show really quickly. I'm going to remind the people that are in the room and Marin and Kyle who weren't here. Um, I'm going to remind everybody what we did in the lab, and then we're going to go ahead and answer the questions for part three. So let me scroll down here really quickly. Where's my, didn't I do a split question? I did somewhere. Why is it not showing split view? Show inline. I did it wrong. Let me try again. Show split. Why is it not splitting? What am I doing wrong? I'm not on the third one though. I was trying to show, it's not splitting. I was trying to show part two and all the videos and stuff. Where are my videos? Am I in the wrong one? Oh, you are smarter than me. Oh my gosh, thank you. All right, so for Kyle and Marin, and then anybody just reminding you what we did yesterday and anybody online that hasn't seen this yet, um, we had this experimental chamber. It's like a, an aquarium. And you had the option of changing. I'll press the button down here. Um, you could change the temperature and you could change the animal or and there was um, also a plant um, and you could change what was in there. So your choices were crickets, mouse, um, peas, the pea plant, um, or rat. And so those were the different things that we looked at. And then what we were measuring was temperature. We measured um, oxygen concentration, the percent of oxygen, and then we measured carbon dioxide. Carbon dioxide was measured in parts per million. And if you look at this red um, area here, those things, that's where we got all of our data from. So then the class split up and some people collected data on crickets and some collected data on the mouse and some collected data on the peas. And we shared all of that data. Mm -hmm. And so let me go down to this final thing. Oh, I'm still not in part two. Here we go. Now I'm in part two. And you know what? I bet I don't have the graph. Okay, you need to see the graph. Hold on. I'm going to switch screens for just a second. There we go. That's what you need to see. So after we collected data on all the different animals or things, the living organisms, um, we looked at their rate of respiration. Can somebody talk me through the graph? What what are we looking at on this graph? Because it doesn't mean a whole lot. We've got temperature along the bottom, and we've got their respiration rates along the side. 
what are things or patterns in the data that we noticed yesterday? Anybody tell me anything? Fiona, tell me anything about the graph. Okay, the lowest two are linear. It's actually, a, I think we call it a positive correlation. Does that sound right? So as the temperature increases, respiration increased. The lower two lines were the crickets and the peas. Those were the lower two lines. The upper two lines, the green one and the pink one, that was the mouse and the rat. And those, although the rat one is subtle, the rat is actually a little bit of a V. It's just kind of hard to see that it's a V, um, but for sure you can see it with the mouse. Um, the mouse's lowest respiration rate was at room temperature. And when it got colder, it actually increased its respiration rate. And when it got hotter, it also increased its respiration rate. And so those are just some things we're seeing. What else do we know about these organisms or whatever? Like just, can anybody give me a little bit of an explanation of what we're seeing here? It doesn't need to be a detailed explanation, but just what are we seeing? Why are we seeing the patterns that we're seeing roughly? Crickets are chirping in my room right now. Yeah, there we go, Peter. Say it out loud. I mean, say it louder. All the way around. They're ectothermic. There you go. Good. Okay, so Peter said that the peas and the crickets are called ectotherms, and the mouse and the rat are endotherms. So the prefix endo means in. So endotherms generate heat from within. Ectotherms get their heat outside of their body, so they get their heat from the environment. So a turtle is an ectotherm. Reptiles are ectotherms. So a turtle has to truck out um, and walk over to a log that's in the sun in order to warm up. And then if it overheats, it's got to walk back and hide from the sun. Question, Peter? Yeah, that, okay, so cold-blooded, warm-blooded is um, sort of the more generic term, the layperson term, and not the scientific term. But so like yes, that, same like idea. That. Yep, same idea. Okay, so so there we have it. So we noticed that the mouse goes up and down. We saw the rat goes up and down barely. And then the um, we saw that the plant and the insect are linear. They go from low to high. Cold temperature, they have low respiration rate. High temperature or warmer temperature, they have a higher respiration rate. And the mouse and the rat have, period, a higher respiration rate than the ectotherms do, that the endotherms have higher respiration rate. Okay, so now I think we're ready to scooch on to part three. And is this part three already? I can't see. I'm going to make it all big for everybody. So hopefully those of you that are online, you're um, looking at part three. So let me show you where part three, this, it looks like part three, it says answering questions about respiration rates. We're gonna all work on this together. I'm gonna help give you some ideas of what to write. So really what I'm trying to do here today, these questions, there's a couple multiple choice, but then mostly it's essay questions. I'm helping you formatting an FRQ question. How would you answer this if this was the question that I gave you on a test? What are things you should be thinking about? Um, how much time should you be spending on one part versus another part? That kind of thing. Okay, so it says, in the previous section, we calculated the respiration rates of different organisms at different temperatures. We will use the data from the previous section from your synthesis graph to answer questions about respiration. Let's learn about endotherm and exo ectotherms. Endothermy and ectothermy are two strategies that organisms use to generate or maintain their internal body temperature. An ectotherm is an organism that derives very little of its body temperature internally and relies on environment for heat. An ectotherm is an organism that maintains its own body at a metabolically favorable temperature by internal means. And you can see my previous answer, I don't like that. Because <laughs> I did these answers with third block, that's the problem. Um, so it says, based on the collected data in the previous section, which organisms do you think are ectothermic? These are the easy questions. So which are the ectotherms? Crickets and peas. And I will say that peas are a little bit different because peas have no choice in the temperature. So peas cannot move 
A little bit. Um, plants definitely lean toward the sunlight and away. Um, and so they have a little bit of choice in temperature, but not much, as opposed to a cricket or a turtle that can walk into the sunlight and walk into the warmth. Okay, um, so hopefully you got that. I'm going to scooch on. I don't want to give away all my answers. So here's the question. This is like our FRQ question that we're trying to answer. How does temperature affect endotherms and ectotherms differently? So this could be an FRQ question that would be something that could show up on a test. Um, and you would want to have um, evidence. You would want to make a claim. And you would want to have some reasoning. Um, the evidence is very specific to your experiment or the data that you're given. So you want to reference our graph. You want to reference numbers. You want to reference the shape of the graph. The reasoning is where you explain why the graph looks the shape that it does. Okay, so let's go ahead and start with the first question. It says, um, they uh, usually we do claim evidence reasoning. And this one is doing evidence claim reasoning. They want you to collect your evidence first and then make a claim from it. So it says, describe the evidence that will help you make a claim about the question, how does temperature affect endotherms and ectotherms differently? So you, it says your response should reference specific data and describe patterns from your data table or graph in the previous section. You don't explain here. You don't explain your evidence. You just describe it. So for example, what is the shape of the graph for the mouse and the rat? How would you describe it? Okay, I love how that was said. So respiration for the mouse and the rat, the respiration increased in more extreme temperatures. We're not explaining why. We're just saying respiration. So start typing, everyone. That's something you could type. Um, you're writing down evidence that you found in patterns that you found from that um, data table. Don't tell me why. Just tell me what you saw. Say that again, Fiona. What was your temperature? Like, how did you Respiration rates in, how, Kyle, how did you say it? Did you say endotherms or did you say the mouse and the rat? You could say endotherms. That's totally fine. So um, the respiration rates in the endotherms increased with extreme temperatures. So if it got extremely cold or if it got extremely warm, um, it went one way or the other. The, the respiration rate increased. Okay. How about what's like, don't make me do it all. What else? Can't, what, el what other patterns did we see? There's a positive correlation between ectotherm respiration and temperature. There's a positive linear correlation between, you guys don't all need to be typing the same thing, so I don't mean to be saying it like we're all saying the same thing. You should be typing, and I'm giving you some ideas of things that you can type. And it's totally okay to talk to your neighbor and say, what did you type? I don't know what to say here. How did you word that? What did she say? I forgot. If you're online and you're like, you're going too fast, KJ, I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, just get on the microphone. I can't actually see you right now because I've got my questions on the screen. So I don't know if you, know, if you need anything. That's so exciting. Kyle and Peter are talking about needing to order their caps and gowns for graduation. That's so fun. Okay. Um, what's one other pattern in the data other than the two we've mentioned? Interesting. Um, give me a second, Fiona. I love both of the ones that were said in class just now. So um, we're not saying why this is, but um, Tara said the smaller endotherm, she didn't use the word endotherm, but the smaller endotherm had a higher respiration rate, um, had generally higher respiration rates than the larger one. And Fiona said that in general, the endotherms were higher than the ectotherms. 
Those are all awesome evidence. All of those patterns. So we came up with four different patterns and that's perfect. Things that you saw in the data table, you're not telling me why, you're just telling me that you saw these things. Okay, so are we ready? I'm, and if, if I'm going too fast, you just need to be like, whoa, 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 slow down. Slow down, I'm told, okay. If you feel ready to move on to question um, four, be my guest to start taking a look at it and thinking about it. I should have warned you. Wait, when I'm here, so start. I'm behind you. I'm behind you. Okay. Question number four says, now that you have your evidence, hey guys, can I have you listen for a minute? I want to emphasize this. When it asks on a test for evidence, that is not the place to interpret your evidence. You're just saying what the data says. You're not telling me why it says it that. Now, the next thing is about making a claim. You don't want to spend hours writing a claim. You should usually be able to write your claim in one sentence. In this case, it's actually a little bit more of a detailed claim, so maybe two sentences are necessary. This is not where you spend your time. You need to make your claim quickly so that you have time to spend on the reasoning part. That's the part where you have to spend some mental effort. Okay, so come up with some claims. Figure them out on your own first. Figure out your claims on your own first. And then we can share them out if we need to. People are like, I don't know to write for a claim. silent in here. I'm not hearing any typing. I think that's a bad sign. <laughs> Have you already made your claim? Is that why? No. Or are you like, I have no idea what claim to make? The former? Okay. How does the latter form? Now that you have your evidence, make a claim that answers the question. How does temperature affect endotherms and ectotherms differently? Ecto, E C T O, ectotherm. Not exotherm. All right. So, what are some claims that we could make? What are some claims that we could make? Parker. Um, more extremes in temperature on either end, the more you can animal has to make the outer warm food. Okay, so the more extreme the temperature, the more heat an endotherm has to make to cool themselves. Mm. To cool themselves, because if it's in cold temperature, they're warming themselves. To maintain a homeostatic, that's the word. Homeostasis is the word for staying at the same temperature, same body temperature. Um, and so to maintain homeostasis, the endotherm needs to use more um, respiration. So respiration has to increase to maintain. There, okay, that's a fast way to say it. Um, to maintain homeostasis, respiration has to increase with changes in temperature. That would be one. What's another thing that somebody said? What's another claim we can make? Tara, how about the thing that you said earlier? She, um, she, Tara made a comment about the size of the two endotherms. What's a claim you could make? Although this is, hold on, because this is supposed to be about endo and ectotherms. So never mind, let's not make that claim right now. 
um, because it's supposed to be about the difference between endo and ectotherm, and that's the difference between endotherms. Does that make sense, Tara? Do you understand what I'm saying? The guy has no idea what she's talking about right now. <laughs> <laughs> okay, fine. Kyle? I just said that um, ectotherms respond to temperature by taking the heat, where endotherms will naturally adjust their body heat to the environment. Super interesting. So he said ectotherms take in heat from the environment, whereas endotherms adjust their heat depending on the temperature, and they do that internally. The problem, I will have to be very honest, I was researching this at length. I could not, I know how they do it. This is a weird thing. I know how they adjust their temperature, but I don't know what triggers it, which is a very weird thing. So I know, I'm gonna remind you of something. I know that they can decouple oxidative phosphorylation from ATP synthesis. I know you're all like, oh my gosh, what's that? I don't remember. I know they can do that, but I don't know what triggers that to happen. I don't know why decoupling happens. Like, I, I mean, I know the purpose of it. Okay, it's hard to explain, but anyway. So that's a little bit of a, I couldn't find anything in the literature that would explain how our bodies know it's time to start um, increasing respiration. Um, Parker? grow much bigger although they did hypothesize that dinosaurs were ectothermic well that's they did die because the temperature of the earth cooled down so much so all right number five it says provide biological reasoning for your claim about ectotherms so we're going to only talk about ectotherms we're not going to mention endotherms right now number um, or letter a how do ectotherms maintain homeostasis very you don't need to write a book one sentence how do they maintain homeostasis they move into warmer places when they're cold done you don't need to write that word for word by the way i probably should have had you answer it before i asked what somebody had said Letter B, let's think about the advantages and disadvantages to being an ectotherm. I think the disadvantage is really obvious. Somebody, without putting it in a perfect answer, just what's a disadvantage to being an ectotherm? Cold, okay? If, the, if there's no warm place in the environment to go, then they slow down. Has anybody, have any of you observed an insect when it's cold? Have any of you ever seen a bee on the ground when it's really cold? Have you ever seen that? Did you do it or? I've seen it and I want So if you put, so this is a little bit cruel, um, but if you put an insect in a refrigerator, it slows them down and they'll move slow, they think slow, everything that they do is slow. Um, and so that's definitely a disadvantage. I'm gonna guess right now you can't think of a benefit. Can anybody, it has to do with our data. Can anybody think of the benefit? What's the difference between the ectotherms and the endotherms in terms of the placement and the data? Fiona? You said that they require less energy. Okay, so what does that mean? They have to do a whole lot less of. They have to eat less. They don't have to eat. <laughs> what she said. Okay, that is an enormous, enormous benefit. They don't have to eat as much. The chickadee. Did we talk? We talked about this in your class. Yeah, the chickadee has to eat one third of its body mass every day to to maintain its metabolism. That's an enormous amount of food. That chickadee is looking for food all the time. So that's a disadvantage. All right, letter C. What is happening at the molecular level? Think kinetic energy. Can we explain our graph having a positive correlation with temperature? 
Can we explain KJ's observation that if a, an insect is cold, it even moves slow? What's going on? Why? It's slowing down their reactions is for sure true. What's happening at a molecular level? What is temperature? Not electrons, but atoms. Temperature is nothing more than a speed of how fast atoms are moving. Atoms are moving, listen before you start typing. Atoms are moving slower in colder temperatures. So I want you to think about enzymes. Enzymes are controlling all of the reactions that happen in a body. How does an enzyme, this is a hint, how does an enzyme work? The molecules have to collide. If they're moving slow, they're not colliding as often. So the reactions are happening less often and more slowly. So for an ectotherm, the reactions are happening more slowly because kinetic energy is lower and there are fewer collisions between the molecules. And then letter D, depending on what you've already written, might be a repeat, and I don't care. If you haven't actually answered letter D yet, then you need to answer letter D. But if in the course of writing A, B, and C, you've answered letter D, I'm okay. It says, why do you see the data you see? So why do we see the linear progression, the positive correlation? What is actually happening in an ectotherm? Why is respiration increasing with temperature? What is the answer? Just point blank. Why is respiration increasing with temperature? Why? Letter C. Keep going. The what? The more kinetic energy, there's more collisions of molecules. The enzymes are colliding with their substrates more often. And we're having an increase in all metabolic processes. Metabolism is a reference to all of the chemical reactions that are happening in a body. That's metabolism. And so metabolism is increasing with increased collisions um, in the body. And that's because they have more kinetic energy. The atoms and molecules in the body have increased kinetic energy. If you've already answered that in the course of your A, B, and C, you're good. I'm not concerned about it. Okay, should I move on or should I wait? Okay, I'm moving on. Now, same questions, number six, but now we're talking about the endotherms. So let me just mention one thing I stumbled across in my research yesterday, just an FYI, because it's interesting and I didn't know it, or I'd forgotten it if I didn't know it. Endotherms have more mitochondria on average per cell than ectotherms do. Let me say that again. Mito sorry, endotherms have more mitochondria on average per cell than ectotherms do. Now that wasn't data from this, that's just something to have in the back of your head that's relevant to this. It does make sense, it makes perfect sense, right? They're gonna, if they're gonna increase their respiration rates, they need to be able to handle greatly increased respiration rates. All right, so how do endotherms maintain homeostasis? Okay, so they increase their respiration rate, good. They do one other thing that I mentioned and it's scary and you guys hate the words and everything. Yeah. Listen to you, smarty pants. I love it. They decouple, they decouple oxidative phosphorylation. I know, how do you spell that, right? They decouple oxidative phosphorylation.
from ATP synthesis. That was from yesterday's notes. That was from yesterday's notes. Right at the end of our cell respiration. Oops, I covered up the camera, you guys. I'm sorry. I don't know if anybody's looking at it anyway. They decouple oxidative phosphorylation from ATP synthesis, which allows heat to be produced at a greater rate than would be normally happen. So they, the two ways that they maintain homeostasis, they increase respiration and they decouple oxidative phosphorylation from um, ATP synthesis. The part that I said I could not figure out was how their bodies know to do that. What is the trigger? Because in cold weather, they should be, their, their um, body should be slowing down also. So what's triggering the decoupling? What's triggering, what's telling the body you need to increase respiration? It may have to do with something like um, at the opposite of inhibition, but activation of different things. But I, I just, I could not find anything in the literature that tells us what's actually triggering the increase in respiration. Do you want me to say it? Is yeah. that what you're asking? Yeah. So they decouple oxidative phosphorylation. Do you need me to spell it or anything? I'll, I'll come back to it. I'll remind you what decoupling means. People are like, what was that again? They decouple oxidative phosphorylation from ATP synthesis. Okay, so reminding you really quickly, coupling is when you put an exergonic reaction with an endergonic reaction. An exergonic reaction gives off energy. You couple it with an endergonic reaction that requires energy. So when we break down glucose, it releases energy. We couple it normally with ATP synthesis to build our ATP molecules. You have to have energy to build ATP molecules. So they're coupled. But in the circumstance when we need to be heated up, we decouple or uncouple. You can use both words. You can decouple them. So now we're not making any more ATP. We're just releasing the heat instead of using that energy to make ATP. And so our bodies warm up, even though we're not making additional ATP in that circumstance. But it requires eating. You need food to do that. And that mouse and that chickadee have to eat enormous amounts of food because their bodies cool down a lot faster than ours do. Parker. Possibly. I, I, I just, I couldn't, I was wondering that myself. I couldn't find anything that would confirm one way or the other for me. All right. Um, what are the benefits and disadvantages of being an endotherm? So it's kind of the opposite of the ectotherm. What's a benefit? <laughs> Don't have to worry about what as much environmental temperatures we don't have to worry as much about environmental temperatures we have to worry about 20 below degree weather for sure but we don't have to worry as much about environmental temperature as ectotherms do not that they worry but it's not going to limit our physiology as much as it would limit the physiology of an ectotherm but what's the huge disadvantage of endothermy Oh, I love it when you guys talk in tandem like that. That was awesome. Requires more energy. They have to eat a whole lot more food. They have to eat a whole lot more food. I think about the poor deer that I see in my backyard almost every night during when it gets really, really cold. Um, trying to find enough food to feed an animal that size. The good news for a big animal is that their bodies don't cool down as fast. So per pound, they don't need as much food as the chickadee does. The chickadee needs more food than they do per pound. Yes, Lila. Okay, so if we have this experiment with humans, like if you just like mess up your thermostat really bad, would our, like if it got really cold, would our metabolism speed up? And then if it was a room temperature, would it go down? 
Can you think that through really quickly? Yes, but I don't know how cold before it actually really starts to slow down. If you become hypothermic, your metabolism slows down. Do you guys, did you guys all hear that? Because Lila's question is super good. <laughs> Endothermy. Endothermy only works within a certain range of temperatures. If we lower the temperature too much, then we can't overcome that. And then we go into hypothermia and then our metabolism plummets. Then it goes way down. Um, so it's just, you know, the small temperature range that we would see that. But then, yes, you would see that. All right. Um, and then let us see what's happening at the molecular level. This is interesting. Why does the mouse graph go up when it's getting warmer? Would it be decoupling more when it's warm? Uh -uh. So I think what we're seeing when the mouse is getting warmer is just same old kinetic energy. The molecules are moving faster, so its respiration rate is increasing. It's not, its body is not doing it on purpose. In fact, that would be maladaptive. That would be bad for the mouse to decouple oxidative phosphorylation and to heat up faster when it's in a warm environment. That would be unhealthy for the mouse. So I think what we're seeing when we see it increase with increased temperature, that's the same thing we're seeing with the ectotherms. Jay. Like yep. Because the cells what? Are you talking about? Are you saying the difference between the the animal and the human is size? Is that what you're saying? Because okay, so just really quickly, you guys, because this is relevant. Small animals heat up and cool down a lot faster than large animals do. So if you compared us to a deer or something like that, we would be a lot more similar. If you compare us to a mouse, our metabolic rates are gonna be very different because we're so much bigger than a mouse is. So that question would depend how big the animal is, what, how we're answering that question. All right. Um, and I'm fine if we skip letter D if you've kind of said it already. Fiona? So the increase, maybe we didn't quite finish it. The increase with increased temperature is due to increased kinetic energy and an increased collisions. But the increase when the temperature decreases is due to the release of heat during the decoupling of oxidative phosphorylation. And then I don't think we need to do anything more in the lab. I think I think we've gotten what we need to get out of the lab. So you may go ahead and hit submit. Um, if you're online and you haven't done the first part of the lab, um, make sure you get that done and then go ahead and hit submit. It, it won't take you that long, but just make sure you do it. Um, yep. Yeah, yeah, you're good if you've done six. If you've done through number six, go ahead and hit submit. And then would you take out a blank piece of paper? It doesn't have to be scratch. It could be your notebook. But we're going to practice drawing um, cell respiration and photosynthesis as a review of both processes. We're going to practice drawing photosynthesis and cell respiration as a review of both processes. Yes. The decoupling with ectotherms? Is that what you said or endotherms? They decouple oxidative phosphorylation from ATP synthesis? Is that what you're asking me? Yeah. 
Yeah, so as the temperature decreases, decoupling increases. But how that happens, I don't know that part. Lindsay's trying to see herself on the camera. There's nothing, did you say? I couldn't find anything. I could not find a word about it. All right, everybody should have a piece of paper out. <laughs> Let's do a cell respiration first because we just did that. What's happening? You're staring. Weirdos freaking everybody out. Everybody who's online, take a look at Bennett. He's being weird. Ben and Bennett. <laughs> the Bens. Oh my God, it is really lagging. Is it really lagging? Oh, interesting. Okay. Okay, I'm going to move around people who are online. All right, let's go ahead and get started. You have already in the room a drawing of cell respiration on the wall. I'm going to need to squeeze in here. Hey, and if you like to draw on your computer better than drawing on a piece of paper, you're welcome to pull up a candy. You can do a blank one and draw online if you would rather do that. That's totally fine. Um, let me see. Can you just a second, folks, online? So I don't necessarily. <laughs> I, okay, hold on. I don't necessarily, folks that are online, I don't necessarily want you drawing this example, but it's there if you have a question. I see that it's backwards. I have no idea how to, why it's backwards and how to flip it. I don't care. It's backwards. That's fine. So those of you that are in the room, I want you to try to draw um, some respiration. As without looking, you can reference the board occasionally, but try with this what you can from memory. And if you need to just physically turn and draw the whole thing, fine. Um, but try to do what you can from memory. Um, you're never going to have to draw this on an FRQ. They're going to give you the diagrams. But the more that your brain has to think about how this is happening, what are the connections, what happens first, second, third, why is it happening? the better you'll be able to answer questions about this. Peter? So, where is that? The CO, in the matrix right here. Yeah. Yeah, that would work. So, what you have saying? glycolysis, and please, please, please feel free to add more details than I did. For example, for example, in glycolysis, we cut it in. This is a six. Sorry, every time I turn toward the board, I get feedback. Um, glucose is a six carbon molecule. The pyruvate is a three carbon molecule, and it gets brought in here, and then it becomes a two carbon molecule that then enters the citric acid cycle. Um, feel free to add whatever additional information you know. Why is the CO2? Is it just, that's just what happens? So as we, uh, the energy from the sun, remember that's where glucose came from. The energy from the sun was stored in the bonds. And so every time that we release bonds, we're releasing energy. And that energy is being captured in numerous different ways, particularly by the taxi calves, which are grabbing the electrons and the hydrogens, and they're going to bring them over to the um, cristae where the oxidative phosphorylation is going to happen. Did that help at all? Yeah, but I was like, where is that CO2 leaving when it joins the citric acid cycle? It um, leaves right prior to the citric acid cycle. Okay. And then there's um, two CO2s that leave here. Mm -hmm. One of them got erased. No one. Oh, like really loud. Yeah. Remember that the citric yeah. acid cycle turns twice. You can say two times. Just helping yourself remember. Two times. Two times. And what I have not shown on this that I personally, if I were drawing it, would want to add is a um, mention of NADHs and FADH2. So I could show, um, actually, I was going to use black for that. Yeah. Wow. Those I could show NADH. Yeah. And FADH2 
Yeah. Heading this direction. You could show them coming back the opposite way as any B plus and F A B. He's definitely doing that. Hey, William. Why don't you want to meet? The more detail William, get on the you can add, the more your brain starts to think about, okay, why is that there? Why, why did she put all those hydrogens in the intramembrane space? Your brain has to start to think about that. Why are there all those hydrogens in the intramembrane space? And what is this blue drawing? She wrote OP here, but then she shows an arrow of this blue drawing. What is going on there? I never finished this drawing. It's only partially done. Parker, get up here. I'm gonna turn finish Parker, finish it. Just, just a little bit. That's, um, how I know this. I wish this was out of the way. It didn't give me enough space. This is ATPase synthase. Are we supposed to draw the um, OP as well? You know what? There are no supposes here. You are doing whatever you think is helpful for your brain. I'm not grading your brain. I'm helping you to study for the test. And I just think that the more little details that you can put in, <laughs> the more you're going to start feeling comfortable with it. Wait, where is FAD? FAD comes, FADH, it's a taxi. It picks up its electrons and its hydrogens during the citric acid cycle. Just one of them. There are three NADHs and one FADH2. She just told me to. I'm trying to erase my paper. Right, but what triggers that protein channel? What allows that protein channel to open up and allow the hydrogen ions to go I don't know. I can't find it anywhere. And that does make me wonder do we actually know the answer? I will pursue that and I'll let know who tries to figure it out. Because I looked over and I found it. I think it has brown parts. 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 Okay, so oh. I'm gonna what my takeaway from that is, which is kind of my what my assumption was, is that the cell has the ability to identify temperature, and when the temperature is going down, it knows to increase decoupling and increase respiration. <laughs> oh, they're just skipping, you guys. Oh, why are people always skipping? Skippers. Kids these days. Right? Hey, what very, very, no very way. important detail is missing from this part of the electron transport chain? The electron. Well, the electron, and yes. And who is catching the electron? The. Um, yeah. Oh. H2O. Okay, we're we're missing the formation then of H two O. Oops, just get one two. We're missing the formation of H two O. So the what? So after the like the NADH and the FADH. Do we have to know all this? Yes. Are they just like they're dropping off their hydrogen and electrons and they cycle back and forth? Yes. Yep. Yeah, other things that aren't really in this drawing because I never finished that particular drawing, but the hydrogen ions are all getting pushed through. So this is going into the intermembrane space. And then the hydrogen ions are going in this direction out of ATP synthase. 
And that's what's causing the formation of ATP. That's what's phosphorylating ATP. I guess we won't get to the photosynthesis drawing. That's okay. What? No. See you. I am, but you'll know at me if I try. So that yeah. model. <laughs> Okay, so Parker and Karina, I guess we're done. Um, we'll uh, try to draw photosynthesis tomorrow, so you guys can go whenever you want. I'm gonna stop the recording. Should we do a quick like flash mob before I stop the recording? Like, should we do YMCA or something? And why well, I saw you. Why see Good. Oh, nice. All right, let's do it. On the tables are written. No, just kidding. Do not get on my tables. They are too flimsy for that. All right, all done. Almost all done. There.